It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Stephen Goman. Dr. Goman has been a faculty member at the, in the Department of Economics in the College of Business at the University of Louisville since 1988. He became the truest distinguished professor of free enterprise in 2009 and director of the Center for Free Enterprise in 2015. His research focuses on entrepreneurship, health economics, and the economics of regulations and beer. He typically examines the influence of regulations on individual decisions. He's published over 60 academic articles, and the results of his work have been quoted in various news outlets and blogs, including The Economist, Wall Street Journal, and the Atlanta Constitution Journal. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Goman. I want to thank you for having me today, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about Bastiat and Hayek and Reed. We're going to start with, with um, Reed first, and kind of an idea of, of what economists think about in terms of the more free market, it's, libertarian is not a good word, but, but probably classical liberal point of view. So the word liberal was hijacked in the 40s. Liberal used to mean classical liberals, which is what they use in England. And now it came somebody on the left, so it's very weird um, terminology. And I think that's happened with a lot of terminology nowadays is, is it has just been changed and words don't have any meaning anymore, particularly like capitalism and socialism which I might have the terms in here if I do, well, I guess I have to tell you what I mean. Uh, but if we think about Leonard Reed's eye pencil, it's really just six degrees of Kevin Bacon. You guys ever play that game? And, and so I actually when I, when I did it, I had a friend from high school and he went, he went to college at um, IU for a while and then he decided, oh, I'm gonna go and, and be in the movies. And so I thought, well, I'll do the six degrees of separation for him because he was in this movie, Blonde, which was on Netflix just recently, this really long movie about Marilyn Monroe. And he's, he's some guy on the plane, and I can't find the, th the connection. But anyhow, so I, I did some of the actors in there, and he's only one degree of separation away because one of the actors in Blonde was in a movie with, with Kevin Bacon, which means we were acting in, in high school that we were you know, not misbehaving, and so I guess I'm two degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon, which is really cool. But if we think about this, this is for movies, but it also applies in almost any product that people produce. And that was kind of what Leonard Reed was talking about and about all the cooperation that must occur between us humans for us to um, thrive. And so, you know, how many people do you think were involved in making this Woodford Reserve? And it wasn't this little bottle, it wasn't like you plant this in the ground and you get this little Woodford Reserve tree, but um, instead it's, you know, it's, it's real bottles of, of Woodford Reserve. Well, how many people do you think were involved? Oh, more than that, probably millions. And so if you, if you think about everything that's involved in making this, I'm gonna go through the family tree, we'll, we'll see there's a lot, of it, a lot of involved. But then it's why would anybody involved in making this be involved in making this? What are they trying to do? They're trying to live. And if you wanna live, you've got to produce. And you can live out in the woods by yourself and you have to go hunting every day and wear fig leaves or something. Or you can be in society where we exchange with each other. And, and the way this works so well is we have to cooperate. If I want, if I want to survive and, and have a good life, I need to produce things that other people want. And if I make other people happy, I serve my fellow man, they give me lots of money. And they give me money because it makes them happy, because they get the things that I produce. And likewise with the Woodford Reserve. I've spent money on this before, not this one, because I got it from Delta. but. Um, but I spend money on Woodford Reserve and I'm willing to give them my money because I value the Woodford Reserve more than the $30, $35 that it cost for the bottle. And so we only buy things that, that are worth more to us than what we pay for it. And, and so I make money by, by being a professor here. Some students pay me for this for some reason. And, um, and, and so I'm better off and they're better off and, and likewise with, with producing Woodford Reserve. So if we think about Woody's family tree, Part of it was corn. He had this family tree. You gotta have a lot of corn. The, the law here is if you wanna make bourbon, it's gotta be over 50% corn. And then it can be rye or barley or other ingredients, but it's gotta be 50% corn. You make it in these stills. This is actually the Woodford Reserve Distillery. So they've got the, the pot stills. You've got some people involved in making this. It doesn't just appear out of thin air. 
and then you have to have water, okay? So this is kind of his basic family, Woody's basic family, and you put it in a barrel and uh, you, you've got you to make the, um, the malted barley and, and corn and, and ferment it, and then you put it in through the still and it becomes alcohol and so forth. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. So if we look at Woody's family tree, so we've got the corn and we've got the um, still and, and we've got the workers there, and then we also have water. And if we go a little bit further, we think about Woody's corny family. So we've got corn being produced. Well, there were people involved in making this corn. So in the corn industry, you've got to have a big John Deere um, tractor to, to harvest your corn. You've got to have some seeds. You've got to have some people involved. And you also have to have water. So he's got a really weird family. He's a little water's kind of involved in his family all over the place. And people are involved in his family all over the place. And so if we go through this, we see that that just for the corn side, we get this family tree. And we can go further out in the family tree with the John Deere tractor because it's going to be made out of steel. So you've got steel workers and you've got the steel mill. And so you think about it, this steel worker, does he know that he's helping to produce this Woodford Reserve? Does he even care? No, he only cares that, hey, I'm, I've got this job. I'm producing steel. I'm being paid. I can use my money to go out buying things from other people that want to serve me, but I'm serving people by making this steel. And so, so we, we've got all these people acting in their own self-interest, producing, use, doing their jobs. So we got the steel worker, we got the corn worker, we got the guy working at the distillery, and they're all just doing this in their own self-interest. And, and you know, we could keep going on from the steel to the mining of the ore and so forth. So there's millions of people involved in making this wood for reserve. That was just making the liquid part. You got the lid and the bottle and, and everything else. And so lots of people are involved. So the steel worker adds a little bit to Woody, even though he may not be his intention. Every worker adds a little bit to Woodford Reserve. Nobody adds a lot to it. I guess the distiller who came up with the recipe added a lot, but he still needed all these other ingredients to, to make it. So each step of this process is a little bit of Woodford Reserve. And there's no mastermind. There's no one person that could do this. And this is what Leonard Reed was saying. It's because we as people cooperate and we cooperate because we want to make ourselves better off that we end up making, up making products like this that make other people better off. And so this is the way businesses work in general, if they, if they do it above board without government intervention. Um, and so what does this have to do with Kevin Bacon? Six degrees of separation, right? I've had students who work at Woodford Reserve. And so the reason this tastes so good is what I've added to those students. And so my value added is I've made this taste a little bit better. And Dr. Gregg will confirm that it tastes all right. But um, so, so this, is, this is really kind of cool. And not only do some of my students work at Brown Foreman, but they work at other places that have also supplied Brown Foreman, done things for them. Some of the marketing around here is done for Brown Foreman. I've had students that do marketing and so forth. So you, you could probably also do this claim, the six degrees of separation. For me, it's like one degree of separation. And probably you could pick any product. You pick some product in India even, and you could probably have six degrees of separation in terms of somebody did something to help produce that product. And you know, somebody makes screws, and if you know anybody that makes screws, they probably added to a lot of products. So, so it's really kind of interesting that, that we are very cooperative in society. If we don't cooperate, we won't have these things. And so, um, so yeah. So this is really a little bit of Adam Smith. Adam Smith said, specialization is determined by the extent of the market. And what he meant there was that when markets get bigger, there's more incentive to specialize. And if you specialize, you can produce more products. And he used the idea of a, of a pin maker where back then the pins were pieces of wire stuck in a piece of wood and, and you had to sharpen them and you dip them in the ink well and so forth. And if one person was making these in a day, they might make 100. But if you had 10 workers, each of them doing one specialized thing, they were able to make 10,000. And so this specialization allows you to produce a lot more output with a lot fewer man hours. If you're in a rural area, you're a farmer, for example, 
you probably have to do everything on the farm. You've got to be a jack of all trades. You don't have a lot of specialization. But if you're in an urban area, you probably specialize a lot. And you can tell as people, as we get in more and more urban areas, we see this in terms of the shops that you can shop at. So if you're from rural Kentucky, some of you probably are, uh, there's not a lot of shops there. If you, if you have a mall, it was probably was anchored by Sears and Pennies and probably had a Claire's and a few other things. And, and that's about it. But you go here in Louisville and there's lots of stores in the mall, a lot more specialization. And so this is, this is a beauty of bigger populations is we get, we get more specialization. And again, cooperation is important. Probably free enterprise, free markets are the most cooperative type of system you can have. In the other system, somebody's forcing you to do something. In the free market system, you're choosing to do something. That steel worker chose to work at that steel factory because for him, that might have been his best opportunity. If he found his better opportunity, he might go somewhere else. So we get a lot more produced with less labor and the specialization works in several ways. First off, if you're kind of doing repetitious things, you become better at it. Even, even in schooling, you guys, as you, as you go through your classes, you're specializing in whatever you're majoring in and you become better at that major the more classes you have, the more knowledge you will have. Think about when you study for, for exams, if you have two exams the next day, do you, do you go back and forth every 20 minutes between what you're studying or you spend a chunk of time studying for the calculus test and then a chunk of time st studying for the biology test? And so you probably do those chunks of time, but what happens when you get done with studying for calculus? Oh, I think I'll go to the fridge and get something to eat and all these other things. So we get all this. If you go in between tasks, you probably don't save as much time. So that's why you stay on one task at one, one time and move to the next. And then you've got an incentive to invent ways to make your life easier. And Adam Smith talked about this. Some little kid had to put this cap down on a pipe when, when this pump was working. And it was just a repetitious thing. But he, he had this machine. It was spinning like that. So he just put a piece of string on it and made the cap go up and down at the right times. And then he, he, he could go out and play. And I know it's just a story. But nonetheless, we have these incentives to invent because it frees up our time to do other things. And so there's also these economies of scale. We get this specialization. When we have um, greater demand, we get economies of scale. We have this incentive to invest in bigger equipment, better equipment. And we saw this in the bourbon industry in the 1800s. Um, in 1831, the column still was invented. Woodford uses the pot still, but the column still actually is more efficient. You can produce a lot more alcohol with it. But you know, the, the argument is they get different flavors out of it. So some stay with the pot still, some, with, some go with the column still. And here in Louisville, we had two railroad bridges built. We had a bunch of railroads coming in. So all these things were happening in the 18, um, early, middle 1800s, and we ended up having a lot more bourbon produced. And so we got, this, is, this was the Kentucky Distillery, which is now not in existence, but um, but this would be an example of how big these distilleries were. And notice it says U.S. bonded warehouse here. Bonded warehouses were the ways that the government was able to collect its taxes. And if you remember the, the Whiskey Rebellion, I'm sure you guys all heard about this in history. What had happened was that people here in Kentucky and Pennsylvania and in the West at the time, they were producing corn. And if you store corn, the rats are going to eat it. So instead, they took that corn and they made it into alcohol and they put it in barrels and became bourbon. And, and so this, this ended up being their money. They would go to the store and they'd give the, the store owner a gallon of, of whiskey for the shovel they needed. And, and so then uh, Hamilton said, well, you know, we need to put a tax on, on whiskey. And so they had a tax on whiskey and they based it on the size of your still here in the West. But in the East, where they had these bigger distilleries, they based it on, on the actual production. And the tax rate in the East was a lot lower than the tax rate in the West. And do you know who had the biggest distillery at the time? You got a picture of the guy right out there with a bottle of bourbon and some bourbon barrels, George Washington. And so this, this um, cronyism, you could argue, is like, hey, we, we'll do a special deal, deal here for, for people in, in the East compared to the West caused problems. And then you had the Whiskey Rebellion and and the tax was removed when, once Jefferson got into um, office. 
Well, so what does this have to do with, with Hayek? If we think about Hayek, he's talking about the use of knowledge in society. And what does knowledge have to do with anything? Well, knowledge is probably the most important things. All the innovations we have are from humans. When, when 5,000 years ago, when there were people around, or let's just do 500 years ago, there were people around and they didn't have any of this stuff that we have. Yet all of the material that we've made this with was here. And so why didn't they make it? They didn't have the knowledge, right? And, and they didn't have the innovation. And, and so we get a lot more innovation nowadays. He wrote this as a response to socialism. But this can also be applied to, to business or whatever you guys end up doing in your, in your lifetime. And so the, a central planner can know scientific information and can make decisions. You know, think about AI. AI, AI makes decisions for you all the time. Open up um, Instagram and whatever appears is whatever you probably looked at in the last week or whatever you talked about on your phone. On your phone, it just pops up, right? And so AI is doing that. And, but information's not perfect. So we could have this, this perfect AI, and they could not organize our economy well, even though we might be able to feed them all this information. And Hayek was making this argument is that even though they could have all this scientific knowledge, they don't have knowledge of circumstances of place and time. And there's also this problem of incentives. So the central planner in Russia, this, this actually, these things actually happened, told the manager of a nail factory, produce five tons of nails. And, and so I want to please, if I'm the manager, I want to please the central planners. So I want to do the best I can, and I want to do it as quickly and as, cost, as low cost as possible. And so what do I do if I have to produce five tons of nails? Well, I think about it a little bit, and I come up with, I'll produce spikes, because they're really heavy. And now we've got five tons of spikes. And so the central planner says, ah, no, 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 comrade, comrade, no, no, we need three million nails. And so what do I do? I think about it again, and I make all these little tacks and make three million of those. What's the problem with this? I'm not producing what the market wants. And the reason I can't do that, and this is the marvel that Hayek talked about, is there's no price system. There was no price system in Russia. So there, was no, there were no prices telling producers, we need more of these little tax instead of, instead of spikes, or vice versa. Whereas in our marketplace, prices change, and when prices change, they indicate that, that people either want more or less of what we are producing. And so for Hayek, this was the marvel of the price system. Prices give incentives. If prices go up, I've got an incentive to make more of that particular product because I will make more money. So I'll please my fellow man by giving you what you want. That's what, that's what business people are doing. You want more spikes? I'll make more spikes. You want more little tacks? I'll make more little tacks. If you want regular size nails, I'll make regular size nails. So the price of spikes increases, it, it signals the to spike producers, other things equal. If nothing else has changed, to make more spikes. And it signals to spike users that maybe they're more dear and you need to be a little bit more cautious in using your spikes. If cost increase, you might produce less. If um, demand increases, you might produce more. So this is the beauty of the market that, that Hayek was talking about. And I don't need to know why the price increased. If I see the price has increased, I'll just produce more of it because I've got that incentive, my self-interest. So self-interest is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And, and um, because of my self-interest, I'm going to produce those things that will give me more money. And by doing that, if the, if the price is up, it's, it's up because people want more of it. I'm, I'm serving my fellow man in a good way. So this is the beauty of the market. The socialist system didn't have prices. Just think about that. So the central planners, there were, Oscar Langa was, was one of these economists on the other side, and Hayek wrote this in kind of a response to him. Langa said, oh, no, we'll just look at other countries and look at the prices in those countries, and it'll give us an indication of what we should produce. Well, there's a bit of a problem there. You can imagine if, if, these were the, 
if you were trying to determine whether or not to produce wood for reserve or still Hnaya, given the prices, the Russians say, oh, well, let's produce wood for reserve. But this is Russia. What do the Russians want? They want still Hnaya. So you don't have that market signal. In Russia, the price differential probably wouldn't look like this as much. And so you can't just use prices for, for, from other countries to determine what people want. And so the, the big part of this was, even though you might have scientific knowledge, we don't have this knowledge of circumstance of time and place. And so let's look at this example. Now, I don't know if you guys ever played basketball, but this is just a simple pick and roll. You've got in diagram A, number one has the ball, passes it to three, him and two switch places. Number five comes up and puts a pick on number three's defensive player. And then number three dribbles around. If they don't switch in time, three passes it to five and five gets a layup. This is just simple pick and roll. So I'm the coach and I tell you guys, I've got five of you out there on the court and say, run this play. Should you run this play? It depends on circumstances of place and time. If for some reason the defense switches up, I would certainly hope that number three doesn't throw it to five if the defensive guy is still on five. Number three needs to figure out what else to do. Take advantage of that circumstance of place and time. AI guy doesn't know what's going to happen in this case. It's what happens immediately. And so we want we don't have that information. We can't feed it into a computer. So even if we have perfect AI, we still won't have this kind of information. So we can't have AI run an economy. So this, this kind of idea of a socialist economy will never work. I'll give you another example that probably all of you can relate to. Um, you know if you're, there's a traffic jam, right? Are you, and you also know where the police are if you're driving down the road. And if you have ways, what do you do? You put it in there, right? You guys do that, or at least Waze tells you wh where this stuff is and redirects you. AI wouldn't be able to do that. We, being in our circumstances of place and time, we see these things happening and we tell our fellow drivers, hey, there's a, something in the road here. There's, um, there's a traffic jam. It's come to a standstill. There's a cop here. That's the best part. Um, but, uh, but, you know, so this is a real, real nice thing. And we're using AI to do this, but we still need us humans with our information of circumstance of place and time to, to, to give this information. And so I think this is a, a really important topic and Hayek won the Nobel Prize based a lot on, on this knowledge argument. And, um, and it, when he, uh, what was the name of his lecture? Um, ah, oh well. He, um, anyhow, it is a very important argument because you still can't use just scientific knowledge to make all sorts of decisions. And then in, you, when you read this article, White has, has this quote, civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking of them. It's like, man, that sounds really weird. I want people thinking about what they're doing. But then if you really think about what's going on here, I don't know if any of you have, are fluent in two languages. Anybody fluent in lang another second language here? Almost fluent? You were getting pointed to. But if, if you, you guys have all had foreign languages probably though, and you take a foreign language, and what do you do when you come up to somebody from that country? You think, oh, how to say hello. I know how to order beer in lots of countries. That's really, I'm fluent in that, I think. But you know, I'm trying to translate in my head, what do I want to say? And then they're answering back and I'm translating it back into English. And I'm not fluent until you don't have to translate. And if you don't have to translate, you don't have to think about what you're doing. If you have a surgeon operating on you, you want him to be cautious or her to be cautious, but you don't want them to have to think about what they're doing. They have to just know they're doing it, right? That's what you really want. You, should get in, you want them to pay attention, but you don't, it's not them thinking about it. It's them being able to do it because they've done it so many times. So, so this quote's actually pretty interesting. And again, it's circumstances of place and time. So how would you apply this to running a business? Businesses are actually kind of socialistic. You got a CEO and he's, if he's very top down, it can be very socialistic. If he's more open or she's more open to um, letting people make decisions, then it's not as socialistic. 
But you want to take advantage of these no this knowledge of circumstances of time and place with your workers. And, and so the CEO doesn't have perfect information. We can funnel information up to her. It's like, hey, there's a problem on the assembly line. Should we stop it? And so I'll probably tell the foreman that. And then the foreman, sorry. The foreman would tell um, the, the manager, and the manager would go up and tell the CEO, and the CEO tells the manager to turn off the machine. The manager tells the foreman, the foreman tells me, and I turn off the machine. Well, if you're a really good manager, you give people decision rights and responsibilities and let them take advantage of this information, this knowledge of circumstance, place, and time. You don't allow this, the, the line worker necessarily to make decisions about what we're going to invest in next, but you do let them make decisions about turning off the machine. Now, if I turn off the machine every time something happens that's really minor, they might, not, they might take that privilege away from me until I learn when does it really matter. But you want to give that kind of um, flexibility to your workers. And, and so Hike's um, ideas can apply for businesses very much. So yeah, you've got to allocate your decision rights and responsibilities. The difference between socialism and businesses are incentives. In socialism, you're going to be told where you work and told what to produce. In business, you're going to be offered a wage to work, and so you decide where you want to work. And, and you might be told, oh, we're going to produce these things, but again, you're going to be given some flexibility of how, what you do, how you do your job. There was a company that made um, brakes for trains, and the output of one, di one division, they had some rods they had to stamp and put something on them, and the output was really low. And so the manager went down and said, listen, if you guys can increase your output, I think they were making 10 an hour, if you can increase it above 13 an hour, we'll give you an extra so much for each additional one you produce. Well, one guy had this, this rod he had to stick in the machine, it would stamp on it, and then he had to put the other side of the machine and it get stamped. And so he had to figure out, should I turn around or should I flip it over? And he figured out a better way to do it. And everybody figured out better ways to do what they were doing, and they were, ended up producing like 18 per hour instead of 10. And so giving the right incentives and giving, the, giving them the ability to decide how they were going to manage what they're doing ended up with a lot more output. And so everybody was made better off. And then finally, a little bit on Bastiat. I guess we still got some time, yeah. So bad economists ignore opportunity cost. We forget about, oh, what, it, what we don't see. And so um, Bastiat stock starts with the broken window fallacy. Some little brat breaks somebody's window. And people around say, man, that really stinks. But the glazier, the window replacing person, he's going to get some money and he's going to go out and spend it in the economy. So this is going to help the economy. And the problem with that thinking is we don't think about the unseen. The fact that the guy whose window was broken spent $50 to get the window replaced now doesn't have $50 to spend at McDonald's and Dillard's and other places. And so we don't see that, that lost spending. Oftentimes you'll see this when hurricane hits. And one person said it when the last hurricane hit um, down in Fort Myers. He said, oh, well, this will be good for the economy. It will be good for construction people, but destroying things is not good for an economy because everybody's replacing things they already had with money that they would have used for something else, or the insurance company would have used the money for something else. Keynesian economics kind of falls into this idea. The idea in Keynes was if, if we're going to recession, government should spend more money, and then we will um, create jobs and get out of the recession. The problem with that is, where are they getting the money? If they take the money from me and they spend my $100, they take 100 from me and spend it, and they produce a job with that $100, the thing is, I'm no longer spending that $100 producing jobs with that $100. And so it's this unseen part that Bastiat was very much, um, very much against. And it's, it's really interesting. He was, a, he was in the French legislature, and he made fun of all of his political friends, and, and I think rightfully so. And he was pretty young when he died. I think he was 52. He had um, tuberculosis. So he went from France, and he went into Rome, because I guess the weather was better there, and he died in Rome. So I went to the 
French Catholic Church of Rome to find his, his grave and you're walking around and you got all these um, tombs and stuff and you're on the floor and I'm looking around for 45 minutes, finally realized I was standing right on top of his grave marker. But, um, but he, was, he was actually a really bright guy and he, I thought he always wrote well. Very black and white, but, um, but interesting. And so there's a problem in, of cronyism. So if a business can't produce enough value for consumers, how else can it make a profit? Well, you can get the government to help you out. So one thing I could do, let's say I was a garbage collector here in Louisville, and let's say it was all private here in Louisville, and some company from Cincinnati comes in and they start collecting garbage, so they, they start taking away some of my business. Well, I just go to my friend Don Corleone and say, hey, you need to talk to this guy. And you need to take 10% of his revenues and give it to me. And, you know, Don being a good friend of mine, does this. Would this be ethical at all? And it's not even legal, but it's not even ethical either, is it? So most people would frown on this. So it's like, oh, I'm not going to do that. So what I do instead, I go to the city council and say, hey, you know, we got these outsiders from Cincinnati <laughs> coming in and taking business away from us local garbage collectors. You need to tax them 10% and give us subsidies of that 10%. Is that legal? Yeah. Is it ethical? It's just no more ethical than this, I would argue. And the only difference between government, which has the legal use of force, and the mafia, which has the illegal use of force, is that government has a legal use of force. Everybody does it, I know. People get, not everybody, but lots of companies do this. Doesn't make it ethical. Bastiat was really, really smart about this too. He said, legal plunder would be me taking, getting the government to take, get things from me. He said, but how's legal plunder to be identified? Quite simply, see if law takes from some persons what belongs to them and gives it to other persons to whom it does not belong. See if the law benefits one citizen at the expense of another by doing what the citizen himself cannot do without committing a crime. It's exactly what I just showed you with the mafia versus the the government. And, and so, the, you know, this, this is what, what he called plunder. I think Ayn Rand calls people like this looters, but they, they're people who use the government to take things from taxpayers for themselves. As the government gets bigger, there's more and more of an incentive to do this. So Bastiat also said, the, both of these come from his, the law. He said, now since man is naturally inclined to avoid pain, and since labor is pain in itself, it follows that men will resort to plunder whenever plunder is easier than work. History shows this quite clearly, and under these conditions, neither religion nor morality can stop it. People will take advantage of government. As government gets bigger, there's more incentive to take advantage of this cronyism. And this has nothing to do with the type of system you have. This happens under socialism, it happens under capitalism, it happens because government gets bigger. People make a jobs argument, oh, well, we need the government to produce jobs. Well, Milton Friedman was out and he saw all these workers working to make a highway and they were all using shovels even though there was a bold, couple bulldozers sitting on the side of the road. And he said, why, you, um, why do you have these guys using the shovels when you have those bulldozers? And the guy said, well, we want to have jobs. And this way more people have jobs. So Friedman, being the wit that he was, said, well, Instead of shovels, why don't you give them spoons? Got a lot more jobs that way. And so Friedman was really quite witty, but, uh, but you know, if, if that jobs argument is a, is a fallacy that, that um, Bastiat would say, you're not looking at the unseen. Here's another example. This was in a sociology book, and I know it's really long, so I'm just going to kind of jump through it. But a, a company decides to move its factory to Mexico, um, because it gets higher profit than the U.S. All right, that stinks because if you're in the city where this factory was, people lose their jobs. And, and he says, well, the corporation doesn't calculate people losing their jobs and the value of their house is going down and all those things that happen in this city. And so this is a really bad thing and it can be devastating and um, these costs are, are not included in, the, in this decision. And so it says, to see this, suppose that the plant and were owned by all the people in the affected community rather than the outside corporation. 
In this case, the impact of moving the factory on home values would not be a negative externality because people would say, let's not move to Mexico. But they're not making a profit. They're going to go out of business anyhow. But the unseen here is, he, he looks at the scene, factories close, people lose their jobs, house prices go down. What is the unseen? Any idea? Where's this factory going? Mexico. What happens in Mexico? People get jobs, house prices go up, people are better off. So we're just trading off who's better off and who's worse off. It's not like, oh, it's just all negative. And that's what we often hear when people talk about things. They'll give you just the negative side of things and not necessarily, oh, but there's some positives. And, and so we, we see this in, in debates about lots of things. Um, we saw it during COVID. Everything's going to be horrible if we don't do these things. We don't lock down. You guys experienced this going through college, and you didn't get the experience you would have gotten in college had we been open the whole time. Oh, we didn't look at those costs. It was just, oh, we got to worry about people um, being close together. Young, young people didn't get COVID bad and die from it very often. I know some people did. But, but you know, it was way overblown the negative side effects, but not necessarily the, the cost of this. The, of lock, lockdowns and so forth. And you can d debate either way, but, but those costs were never discussed. And people that brought them up were shunned in the media. I've got friends that did it, and they got in big trouble. So there you go. He talks about the arts. So the, the problem with the arts is the government will take your money and, and spend it on buying artwork. Well, what would you have done with that money is, is really the unseen. But then there's another question. What do we buy? Do we buy this Van Gogh? Or do we buy this whatever this is, which is actually kind of cool. I think I'd buy that one. Or do we buy that one? Well, who makes that decision? There's some bureaucrat up in Washington saying, oh, well, I think I'm, we're going to buy this thing, whatever that is. And, and so the consequence is, is we get art that maybe we don't even care about. Symphonies get subsidized all the time. I love the symphony. And oftentimes local local companies will subsidize our symphony here, but it's their money and that's fine. But when they take our tax dollars, it's a different story because I might have spent my money somewhere else. We'll talk about this more during our discussion. And finally, in a free market, the consumer is the king. People say, oh, Walmart put companies out of business. Walmart did no such thing. Consumers put those companies out of business by shopping at Walmart. Walmart just came in and said, We've got a more efficient way of, of better logistics. We can sell our products at a lower price, make you better off. And we consumers decided, I want to be better off. I'll spend money at Walmart and have money left over to spend on other things. And I know if you have family business, it, it would stink to lose your business. But nonetheless, we consumers made that decision. It wasn't Walmart. So through buying and selling, everybody has a voice about who she wants, who he or she wants and what, what you want and what you don't want. Everybody gets that voice. We vote with our dollars. Much easier than voting for our politicians, which we vote for every two, four, six years, right? So you don't like what your politician's doing, you're stuck with that person for a while. You don't like what a business is doing? I have businesses I don't buy from because I don't like what they're doing. Do it immediately. It's my money, I'll spend it where I want. Um, so we, so we we don't have that freedom to change so easily. And you know, people say, oh, well, you can move out of the country. Other countries have governments too, so you got the same problem, right? But with, with businesses, you can spend your money where you want. Are businesses immoral? Businesses aren't people. People are immoral or immoral. Businesses have people that are moral or immoral. So you can't say a business is immoral. Things that people in that business did could be very immoral. And we've seen this with Enron and with FTX guy who's like, oh, you know, I care about everything, and then he blew all that money away. Um, so, so we do have people doing that. For, for the most part, firms care about their customers because they have this repeative, repeated customers. I'm going to come in and buy from you again and again. So if I treat you well, you'll keep coming back. If I don't treat you well, you won't come back and buy my products. So I've got this incentive to, to make people better off, and that way I keep business around. We need a legal system to, to make sure we enforce contracts honestly and fairly amongst everybody. Um, if I had hide adverse um, things about my product, 
you've got to have legal recourse. I'm selling your product saying it's one thing when it's really something else. We need legal recourse for that. And, and so we, good legal system makes, makes it easier for businesses to actually um, become better. And then we have the problem of cronyism. We already talked about that. Problem, some people are bad people, but that's going to be under every system. It was much worse in Soviet Russia than it was here, even back at the time of Soviet Russia. So I'm going to finish with a little bit on economic freedom. Why, why do we see some countries growing more so than others? They have really small, they have relatively small governments, not really outrageous taxation. They have private property that's enforced by a rule of law. Money supply is relatively stable. They allow people to trade, low tariffs. There's really no difference between you guys trading, buying stuff made in Indiana and you guys buying stuff made in Mexico. It's just there's some imaginary line. And so people say, oh, no, we shouldn't buy from other countries. If you really feel that way, you can make this um, absurd argument that if that's the case, well, then we shouldn't buy anything outside of Kentucky. And then you say, well, no, let's make it even more so. If, if we really care about it, we shouldn't buy anything out of Louisville and make it even smaller. Shouldn't buy anything outside of my block that I live in. In fact, you just shouldn't buy anything. You should just produce everything. Because that's in effect what you're saying. And, and you don't want to live in that kind of world, I don't think. And then we want low regulation of business. The good thing about economic freedom, or what we've seen over time is poverty has actually gone down even though the population's increased. Poverty is less than 10% of the world, where it's, I think it's um, extreme poverty. Um, and so that's, that's been quite dramatic decrease over time. If we look at more economically free countries, a lot less poverty, much lower percentage than in those countries that don't have much economic freedom. By the way, I'll give you an example of who's economically free and not. Top two, Hong Kong, Sing uh, top five, Hong Kong, Singapore, Switzerland, New Zealand, Denmark, United States is seventh. Bottom five, and, and North Korea is not included because they can't get data on that. Um, Syria, Syria, Zimbabwe, Sudan, Venezuela, Argentina is um, fifth to last. So, you know, think about, would you want to live in those countries? Probably not. And they don't have much economic freedom and they have a lot of people in poverty. Um, if you're in the poorest 10%, it stinks. But if you're the poorest 10% of the free countries, your income's about 13,000. Whereas if you're in the least free countries, it's about $1,000 a year. Per capita GDP has grown dramatically as economic freedoms increased. Per capita income, so this is per person, um, the more free countries tend to have a lot higher income per person, about 50,000. 50, know, that's a pretty decent amount of money. If we look at literacy, literacy rates have gone up, and so that's been a good thing. If we look at the literacy rates by by gender, this is really a sad story. So in the, in the free countries, there's really not a lot of difference. It's probably not statistically different. Maybe it's 1%, I can't tell. But look at the least free countries, how badly women are treated. And, and the people that do this Economic Freedom Index, they also, do a, they also do an index that includes how women are treated, and it shows the same thing. In the least free countries, women are treated much worse than, than in the um, more free countries. And that's a really sad statement on this, on things, I think. Life expectancy has gone up dramatically. And if we look at it in the freer areas, it's gone up by a lot more. Economic freedom in general has been growing some. And so that means in the whole world is getting better off. Political and civil rights, not only is it just income and money things, but we have a lot more um, civil rights, a lot more political rights when we have more economic freedom. And then look at things like happiness, life satisfaction, again, more economic freedom, people are better off. So this is why economists argue we need free markets, because it makes people better off. It allows humans to flourish. And human flourishing is really important. I think it's probably one of the most important things we can, we can look at. So I'm going to summarize this as the last thing. Is individuals know what's best for themselves. You know what's best for yourself. Now, sometimes you'll make mistakes. And thank God you have parents and friends and family to say, hey, really, you need to think about these things. But you still, you've got to make the decision what's best for yourself. Countries with government that appreciate individuality have economic freedom. They leave individuals to pursue their interests. 
and we tend to see more growth. Because when you pursue your interest, if you want to live, you got to produce things that make your fellow man better off. So really, free enterprise is making people better off. I know some of you said, well, I want to work for, um, for uh, charity or, or, or do social work. And those are all great things. Producing products is a great thing because you're making people better off there too. All those things make people, people better off. So most policies, we hear the seen consequences. People often ignore the unseen portion because they really want to push their point of view. And they won't tell you, oh yeah, if we do this, here's the negative of things that will happen. Or here's other things that are occurring. And so the unseen is often ignored.